Hello everyone and welcome to our second episode of Women in Hypercasual by BitShake. Uh, so today we are hosting some bright ladies at the leading ad tech companies in order to talk about how to take your UA to the next level in 2021. So girls first, can you please introduce yourself briefly? Sure, I'm in Bal. I'm a partner development team leader in EMEA at AppsFlyer. Hi, I'm Yael, I'm account manager in TikTok in Israel. Hi, I'm Anna, uh, analytical consultant at Google. Thank you, girl, for being here. Like, really, we really appreciate that you shared this moment with you. We're all vaccinated, by the way, no corona issue. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm Alexandra. I'm one of the two co-founders at BitShake, the leading UA automation platform. So 2020 was an unprecedented year, uh, I mean, in general, for myself, but more specifically for mobile and for gaming. Uh, gaming in general, hyper casual experienced massive growth. And it seems that 2021 is going to bring a lot of challenges and perhaps as well greater opportunities. We will have fiercer competition in hyper casual. We'll have advertisers who need to deal with privacy policies that are not yet super very clear, or at least how they will adapt. Uh, and also there is a lot of concentration in the mobile ad space, in the ecosystem. So all of this is going to bring some new challenges. And we wanted to discuss today what are your tips, recommendations and insights on how to be prepared to uh, make the most of your UA in 2021. So let's start, girls, with the first question. Um, I would like us to start first with an overview of 2020 and the main trends that you saw uh, in hypercasual in 2020. Maybe in Bal, we'll start with you. Sure. So as you said, 2020 was mainly um, affected by a pandemic, right? So what we saw is a huge increase in anything related to installs in mobile uh, gaming apps, which is very cool for the gaming space, obviously. And Hypercasual really saw an even bigger increase of doubled the amount that they saw the previous year, which is really cool. Um, this is obviously because people were at home all over the world looking for entertainment, looking for something to distract their minds. And oh, they were kids. all, <laughs> for sure, they were all turning to their mobile device and downloading apps and obviously gaming apps. And uh, for new users that never played before, it was mainly easier games, softer games like Hyper Casual that uh, they were downloading. So this is why we saw this uh, huge growth. And um, the interesting thing is that we saw that Hyper Casual publishers really picked up that trend throughout the year. So they even shifted more efforts into their user acquisition campaigns to kind of meet the demand from the market. So they were really leveraging this uh, nice increase. You're, you're talking in terms of spends and budgets. Right? Exactly. So even pushing their uh, UA budgets even further to kind of meet the demand and make more and more people download their, their gaming apps. So that was uh, one of the biggest trends we saw for gaming. I think another one we saw is that large developing markets like like Brazil, like Indonesia, like India, um, like Russia to some extent, showed the biggest growth in installs and in downloads of gaming apps and in installs in general that year. Um, uh, surprisingly, I Hyper Casual was kind of showing not the same trend. They were actually going after Western markets like yeah. US, UK, France, mm -hmm. where they saw most of their growth. So okay. that was mainly what we saw. Of 2020. Thank you, Inbal, for those interesting insights. Yael, do you want to add something? What did you guys see at TikTok? <laughs> so, well, yes, definitely the year of pandemic created a lot of change in, in the way users uh, uh, are interacting with apps and we definitely saw an increase in their need for uh, social interactions and to become a part of online communities. So as you know, in TikTok, our, uh, we are one of the most, I say, the most downloaded app uh, within 2020. We reached to over 2 billion downloads wow. during this time. Um, and we definitely saw this change. We saw users with their families uh, creating videos, parents and their children. Um, we saw a lot of change around it and advertisers understood that. And they wanted to, to be part of it and to uh, take advantage of the organic growth. So we did create a lot of products around it. One of it was a Boosted TikTok, which is a product that helps them to push uh, their organic content from the creator's page or from their own business page, which definitely helps them to, to interact with their audience in a new way. Perfect, yeah. interesting. And did you see uh, the audience becoming older uh, in 2000? You mentioned that people were doing videos mm -hmm. with their families. 
TikTok was initially for a younger audience. Do you see like a step towards more adults or older people? Definitely. I think yeah. it's something that we can't miss. I mean, we see the children that are uh, telling their parents to create videos with them and, and we definitely see it uh, uh, in our user-based growth and we see it in the, in the relevancy for new uh, verticals starting to advertise and also uh, hyper-casual. Thank you so much, Yael. Anna, what, what were the biggest trends at uh, Google? Um, I think, first of all, plus one on uh, geos and, uh, and general growth, especially in hyper-casual, uh, like um, in Bal said. But another interesting trend that we saw was, especially in the second half of the year, um, was an increase in Android installs. So installs coming from Android, specifically for hyper-casual games, which uh, um, sometimes are known to be very iOS heavy. So we saw... Um, quite significant, around like even 50% increase in installs coming from Android. But was it because more budget was pushed to Android or...? So, um, yes and no, um, because we also saw uh, some metrics improving like CTR and IPM. And what is more interesting, I think, is that YouTube was um, the main driver of, of this uh, trend. So. We think that uh, YouTube is really like emerging as a um, very big driver of both scale and quality on Android, which we haven't seen before. And we think it can be um, maybe due to several reasons. One is, first of all, growth of uh, increase in gaming related content and audiences on YouTube. Um, and as well, uh, on the other hand, advertisers creating more um, YouTube-oriented videos, right, for in their advertising. So we see both combination of more relevant placements and the That's correct creative that resonates, you know, with those new users. And YouTube is really becoming a, a major source of quality traffic. And, and, and Anna, in regards to what you were saying about the trend, did you see any gender-specific trend maybe happening in 2020? We know that hyper-casual is less gender-oriented. Did you see this rise in women players? And um, We think so, that um, because of what we discussed earlier, um, the increase in, uh, in players that are new to gaming or non, you know, not classic gamers, um, and we believe a large part of these people are actually women. And um, we can see um, an increase or, you know, on the performance of games which are considered to be women oriented, maybe. So hitting like top charts, driving these amazing numbers. Um, so when I say women oriented, uh, I mean both, you know, uh, game genres which are known to be dominated by women. Yeah. Like, for example, ASMR or do it yourself, these type of games and also um, women-related content, I call it, for example, like high heels, high heels. <laughs> which is my personal favorite, um, <laughs> like also Girl Genius uh, by Lion Studios, these type of games also like gaining this big traction. And uh, I think it's, it kind of signifies that, yes, we do have a lot more women gamers, specifically in hyper-casual than Great. before. Did, did you see the same, uh, Yael, at TikTok? Well, definitely, I wanted to say plus one on, on what you just said, uh, because we, we do see it. I wouldn't say that my uh, advertisers are investing in targeting specific gender, because they are, as you said, they are approaching to, to everyone. But we do see that there are games that are more popular for female, if it's do-it-yourself, if it's a craft or puzzle games, that definitely we see growth there. Um, but we are not doing any specific gender targeting, and we really try to, to attract all, all genders. Great, thank you. Uh, I think that one of the things that we saw as well in 2020 is a bigger competition, like more and more, you know, like the big game publishers became bigger and also we saw, I mean personally at BitShake, a lot of small developers that used to get their games published by, you know, Voodoo, Crazy Lab, like those big guys, suddenly decided to say, okay, we want to go into self-publishing. So there is this growing competition uh, and it's of course becoming harder to get the user attention. So what are your recommendations and how do you think that advertiser can get the user attention except by the obvious paying higher CPIs uh, answer? <laughs> uh, Yael, you want to start on this one? Definitely. So I think in general the user's uh, patience really changed. I mean, they are looking to identify with the content they are seeing. Uh, they are looking to, to see more native content. So. 
If I would need to recommend to an advertiser who wish to, to succeed in advertising in TikTok, so I would say first create less Polish ads. I mean, um, be one of the users, understand the, the latest trends, what is happening in the app, uh, if it's the soundtracks, if it's the challenges, and, and, and fit your own creatives to, to what is recently happening. And if we look on the advertising and what, just, what recently happened is that we found that users tend to listen and to follow more after creators. I mean, there is a huge change around it. And um, I mean, these creators are people sitting in their homes creating videos for fun or I don't know, from any other reasons. And people like to listen to what they have to say or to follow them. Uh, and we did recognize the need of, of advertisers to, to be part of that and to communicate in a different way uh, with their audience. So one of the things that TikTok is offering is TCM. And TCM is TikTok Creator Marketplace, which is a platform where advertisers and brands, they can uh, collaborate with creators. And we have over 30K creators in more than 20 markets. Um, so definitely this is something that shifted the way uh, advertisers are producing creatives and communicating with their audience. And I believe that uh, during 2021, we will see it even more. We, we saw a hyper casual gaming companies exploring uh, influencer marketing. And I mean, your TikTok creator at the end of the day, it's like an influencer network within TikTok. So yeah. Um, what about you, Anna? What, what did you see uh, at Google? What do you I would, Yeah, I would recommend uh, creative differentiation. Yeah. Um, because, you know, hyper casual creative tends to be so, so gameplay focused, um, which I'm not saying is it, it shouldn't be, but there is much more, I think, to be done with it. So, for example, showcasing um, different elements and aspects of the games that will uh, cater to different gamer motivations. So, for example, you can uh, have the same game, but one creative that focuses on, you know, the aspect of winning and passing levels and advancing in, in the game, and another one that, you know, um, puts more emphasis on uh, stress relief, on relaxation, and it, and it can be pretty much the same game and still show the classic gameplay, hyper casual, you know, uh, very um, action driving type of, of creative. And the thing is that, for example, with app campaigns. Um, how the algorithm works is the more diverse creatives you will feed to it, eventually it will, um, it can both expand your scale because it will find more audiences and improve conversion rates because it will serve the correct creative for the correct uh, user depending on, you know, what will move them to download. So I would definitely recommend exploring different types of, of creatives. So creative, 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 but with iOS 14, it's going to be hard to get the reporting per creative. Uh, so I guess you understood where I want to go now. I mean, we're the 15th of March, iOS 14, it's supposed to happen anytime from now to the next two weeks. Um, so I would like your take on, and it's the $1 million question, uh, how do you think iOS 14 is going to affect uh, advertisers and more specifically hyper-casual marketers? And, and in that, I would like to start with you uh, on Apps Player. So wh wh what's your take on that? Like, I feel like it's the only thing we've been talking about yeah. in the past <laughs> few months. Um, I think the effect is going to be huge on all of us, advertisers, hyper-casual, publishers, attribution, Everything we know up until today on how we see the data, how we measure apps activity is going to change completely. So in that sense, we know that we're going into a new era in, uh, in the mobile space for sure. When it comes to advertisers, they really need to shift their strategy when it comes to their iOS app, mainly because the main solution we're relying on moving forward is SKA Network by Apple, which is a measurement solution that is quite limited to say the least. Um, will only be reported on the first couple of days in the user lifetime journey. We will only be able to measure just a small number of events. So every advertiser will really need to think of their strategy, business strategy on two, which events they want to measure, how they can really take the data, the limited data they're getting and make the most out of it. So that would be really changing the state of mind specifically for iOS. I would also say making sure they'll have to make sure that they're with someone or with an attribution provider that has the ability to obviously connect to SKN network, display all of the information, make life easier, right? Because it's a big change for all of us. So having everything in one place, all of the information they can get from SK in one place where they can further analyze it and have additional layers on top of it. So I think that's 
what will really create the change being able to analyze, being able to predict, so have predictive analytics, so can you for tell example. You tell us more about those predictions because, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people saying, okay, with uh, iOS 14, Apple is going to report directly to the network, so people are a bit questioning the role of uh, MMPs and attribution partners. So what do you have to answer to these people and why do you think it's still important and very important, I do believe personally, to continue Definitely. to work with an attribution it's partner? It's crucial, yeah. in my opinion. In theory, you can connect as an advertiser, as a hyper-casual publisher, you can connect to SK and theoretically collect all the information yourself. But it's not your core business, right? You can also do attribution yourself, but nobody's doing it. You'll need to first connect to all of the networks you're working with, with, right? Because Apple is reporting to the network and not to the app owner. So you're connecting to everyone, taking the data from them, showing it in one place on your side somehow, right? And then you need to report back to all of your networks on what is the conversion value? What is the mapping you're doing on your side? Because they cannot know. This means that you're sending back what is the mapping and you need to really make sure that it fits the um, network co parameter convention, right? So you really need to have a huge operational effort here. And that's the very basics of having an attribution provider. One hub that is doing it for you, collecting all the information from networks, sending the translation back, as an advertiser using an attribution provider that is connected well to SK, you don't need to do any of that. So in that sense, you're not distracted from your main business, your core business. You're not starting to, me to measure, right? And as I started to say, you have additional layers, especially I know the AppsFlyer ones, obviously. So you do have predictive analytics to understanding from the very short time frame you're getting from Apple. Is this campaign working? Should you keep on investing in it? Should you stop it? So you have that layer, you have probabilistic modeling for all of those scenarios SK is not going to measure, like web to app. So it's all of those additional features that you're also getting from your attribution provider. But obviously this is only related to iOS. You also have your Android, uh, Android app, which you'll have to have attribution still. Yeah, I think it's very clear. Um, and what, what do you girls think about iOS 14 and what, what's the take of TikTok on iOS 14? How do you think it will impact hyper-casual advertisers? Well, yes, there are a lot of open questions uh, around it and we are uh, learning the new situation and uh, we are um, definitely adopting uh, the SCAD uh, API and we are collaborating with our uh, mobile measurement partners, uh, of course, uh, Bal. Um, so, uh, I believe the, the main impact would be around the strategy. Uh, like Imbal mentioned, we are guiding our client what should be the strategy and we are, I mean, it's an ongoing process that we are learning together in order to continue to reach the most quality users in the most accurate way. So, of course, we have the limitations of the number of campaigns that we are able to have, but uh, I truly believe that during time we will uh, develop more and more solutions and. Um, and if we look on TikTok, I think eventually it's a huge opportunity for us. I mean, we are pretty the, the new, I don't know, the new guy in the neighborhood and we are here only for three years. We are less relying, heavily relying on user data. So we are definitely seeing it as an opportunity. Um, and I believe that we will have more and more solution uh, for our clients during time. Yeah, I think it's a matter of adapting. We, we're lucky to be in a very dynamic industry that has seen a lot of changes uh, in the past eight years. So I believe there is room for adaptation here, but Anna, what's uh, the take of Google? I mean, Apple, Google? <laughs> yeah, I will say, um, I think like there are two, um, two parts, right? To, there's the sell side and the buy side, which both will be impacted probably. Yeah. So on the sell side, um, CPMs are, will possibly be impacted and CPIs on the other hand, we're not sure what will be the impact and uh, by how much, right? So this is like, we will have to just wait and see until the, the change rolls out and see what the new margins will be. Um, but we do, we do hear about um, advertisers that are looking into and examining some, uh, some new uh, monetization models, like uh, maybe a little bit IAP, a little bit subscription, trying all these new stuff. So this is also an interesting um, you know, trend to, to watch for. And on the buy side, there's obviously the measurement challenge, um, which uh, affects everyone, but is it also hyper casual, which uh, tend to have a large share of YouTube on iOS. Yeah. Um, so there uh, we will be using modeled conversions. Mm -hmm. So Google believes in conversion modeling, which will be based on data both from SK Ad Network, but also from the many, many signals, you know, that we have from all other sources. So this will, uh, this will be the way to go there. 
and um, campaign uh, tiering, you know, uh, campaign limitations is also an issue, especially for hypercasual, which uh, tend to, to separate a lot by geos just because it's possible, because we have enough events usually to, to sustain a, a large number of, of very granular, you know, geo targeting. Um, and there we, we do recommend to tier geos together by performance to, to not exceed the eight campaign limitation uh, of SK network, even though we don't have a hard limit. So it will, you will be able to run it, you know, as many campaigns as you want, but uh, the recommendation is to tier geos by performance. And, and Yael, what is the recommendations of TikTok in terms of campaign setup? I believe that there are also limitations. Do you recommend to group by geos as well in terms of performance? Like um, yes, definitely the, the recommendation is uh, basically the same. We are aware that uh, 11 campaigns in TikTok is not enough for hyper-casual clients. So uh, the main recommendation would be to consolidate markets based on CPMs, based on ARPU, and, and start the process from there. And then we will optimize the ads and we will understand which creatives is better to run together so it will be easier for advertisers to learn what is the right structure for them to continue to approach to, to their uh, most quality users. Okay, so now we'd like to talk about uh, the innovations that uh, you provide to hyper-casual uh, game publishers. And can you tell us how they can best utilize your platform in 2021? Anna, I would like to start with you, please. Okay, so one of the things that uh, we've been working with our hyper-casual advertisers recently is, uh, I call it looking beyond CPI. Okay, so just in terms of sometimes uh, it's a challenge to, to acquire real scale with, with the really low bids that hyper-casual advertisers uh, uh, need and like to use. So we do see a, an increase in the usage of TCPA bidding with hyper-casuals, um, especially towards the end of 2020. Um, all, almost a 50% increase like uh, compared to the beginning of the year. Um, these are already like significant numbers. We do recommend advertisers to test uh, some deeper funnel events, not very deep, but maybe like second day retention or a uh, number of games played, etc. Because what it does is, first of all, it uh, feeds the algorithm with uh, data about higher quality users, users with higher lifetime value and focuses the algorithm towards these users. And also, since these events require higher bids, you can gain both uh, like easier scale and faster ramp up for, and growth for the campaigns, and you can uh, reach higher value inventories, which sometimes, uh, if you're bidding very, very low, you will, you will not be able to reach. And, and do you see a real increase in both scale and uh, LTV or retention while bidding CPI or TCPA? Because I know it's, it's an issue that all big networks, whoever was not an SDK network is saying, okay, our CPIs generally are a bit more expensive. For hyper casual, it might be a challenge. Uh, so go for TCPA. But do you see at Google that it is really bringing scale and... Uh, if you are choosing the correct events and the correct bids for these events, yes. But we also have a you know, lighter version <laughs> Of, of this strategy, which is still bidding on TCPI, but when you are examining the performance to determine your bids, we encourage um, the advertisers to look at past day zero. Yeah. So look at retained users on day one, two, and three. And what we usually see there is that even if, um, you know, on day zero, our CPIs uh, might seem a bit high, then actually when you're looking at these users uh, down the line, then it's actually like a decent price and sometimes we even see that we can go even higher and then you are bidding higher and reaching these higher quality um, inventories and it's easier to scale. Interesting. What about innovations at uh, TikTok? So um, I would say well first we are new um, and we are here for a few years and I think uh, one of the biggest things that is most important for hyper casual clients is the markets. Um, we know that, of course, the hyper-casual can monetize in tier one and can monetize in the U.S. market, which is over 100 million uh, monthly active users. But if we look beyond the tier one in the U.S. Uh, and we look on the Asian markets, for example, so here in TikTok, compared to, to other channels uh, in general, we have 
high demand for these markets because we look on their monthly active users and daily active users and if I'm talking about Japan and Korea and Taiwan, all these markets beyond the tier one, uh, so definitely there is, there is high potential there for hyper casual clients. So in both for TikTok as well as for Pangil, which is our SDK network. So yeah, can you tell us a bit more about Pengel because I'm not sure everyone is familiar with it. Uh, so Pengel has launched an SDK network which is called Pengel. It's booming in Japan, Korea, Russia, uh, and it's now coming to EMEA, right? Can you can you tell us a bit more about Pengel and how to buy on it and what kind of in inventory it is? Yes, so, so Pangal is our SDK network, it's, it's a premium network for us, uh, you, can buy to, uh, you can buy directly from our ads manager, uh, you can buy in Pangal. So it's more, it's a gaming network I would say, over 60% of the, of the publishers there are gaming. Uh, there are a lot of benefits in advertising there. If we start in thinking about the placements themselves, so we have rewarded videos, we have interstitials videos, so actually we have a lot of different placements there uh, that are much more, I would not say much more, but suitable as well for gaming clients where you can find your user in the most comfortable uh, place uh, because they are already playing other games. So also in Pangel you have the, the option to, uh, to use playables, which you can't do it at the moment uh, in TikTok, uh, which is also something that helps them uh, in the auction and also to help them to convert the users uh, more easily. And, and just um, for the sake of clarity, in order to use Pengel, it's not a separate platform, it's on TikTok and you can buy simply from a different placement, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the, so they don't need to go to another they can use either auto placement and, and to um, um, let the algorithm, and let the algorithm yes, to, to go to Pangal or they can just use direct targeting as well. And I wanted to add as well, not only about the Asian market, but also uh, TikTok uh, value proposition is, is the fact that we can advertise in China. Uh, which is something that is unique to us. And if you think about the inventory of China, we have over 700 uh, million monthly active users. So the inventory is endless. And we see the results that our advertisers are getting, especially hyper casual clients. Um, and we look on the, on the character of the uh, Asian uh, people that they love to play games. They like to interact with, uh, with our mobile app. So, Eventually, this is a huge opportunity for advertisers. And, um, and, and if we think about uh, hyper-casual games so, uh, and their entry to, to advertise in China, so we know that these are simple games. It's mainly a gameplay. They don't need to localize their app. They don't need to create any, uh, to do any specific efforts in order to, to start advertising there. So this is also something that is uh, important that we need to, to consider when we are trying to uh, advertise in, uh, in Asian markets. It's a big opportunity there. And um, in Bell, what about innovations at AppsFlyer? Yeah, I feel it's from another perspective completely. It is. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, innovating in the way of how you look at your data. And I think what is really important for hyper casual games is cost of their campaigns, obviously, revenue coming from it. So in the AppsFlyer main dashboard, they can easily see that per campaign in real time so they can see the full ROI and then make smart marketing decisions based on it in it's real time. The expand the dashboard, Exactly. Right? Yeah. Ah, I like it that you like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing we show there as well is ad revenue. So all of their ad monetization efforts is also displayed there so they can easily understand where they need to kind of shift their strategies, right? Based Which on is very important because a couple of years ago, it was not really available on none of the attribution platform like two and a half years ago. Everyone had to build that internally, but now you're True. integrated, I believe, with Iron Source, Mobile Max, Admo. Right. Right. everyone especially because of the importance for yeah. gaming apps and for hyper casual obviously they also have raw data reports with apps flyer so they can download user level data when there's consent and <laughs> further <laughs> slice and dice their information understand where the value is coming from which users from which campaigns i think that's really important and the final thing is that is an additional layer we're now adding of not only reporting ad revenue Predicts. to clients but also pushing it back to networks so they can optimize their UA campaigns based on who is interacting with ads, which campaigns is providing users which that are... Which is very important because they now have ROAS campaign, uh, I mean, mostly the SDK network, so I believe this is uh, exactly. an something crucial they need. Right. Great. And all the monetization partners are allowing for their data to be pushed back to the ad networks or is there not any yet. limitation? Good question. So not yet. Most of them are. There are some that are um, originally not allowing to share with third-party uh, yeah, yeah, third companies their data. 
Um, I think something to also take into consideration that it's not always objective, right? So some of them are allowing two companies that are working with to share their data while uh, other attribution providers can't. And so they're kind of uh, shifting the, the way uh, our industry can I, actually operate. I don't know operate. who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody familiar. <laughs> uh, so bottom line, what is your recommendation to hyper-casual publishers in 2021? In that we're starting with you. All right. I think uh, uh, when we think about 2021, there's a lot of uncertainty, mainly coming from two big forces, I'd say. One is obviously iOS 14, which we discussed, and the other one is pandemic still going on. We don't know how it's going to affect uh, the industry and obviously gaming apps moving forward. So I think what I would recommend to hyper casual games is to look at these as not challenges, but actually opportunity to grow as they did in 2020 and kind of took the opportunity and uh, really sh and saw a nice increase there. So that's what I would recommend. Keep on being innovating, making sure you adapt to whatever the situation brings. I would also say remarketing. Uh, making sure not only to chase new users and make potential new users download an app they never had before, but actually use the database you already have, right? So users that's for that, Android. Right. <laughs> but still, we're not only talking about iOS <laughs> and iOS that gave consent. So for those users that you, are, that you have already that are using your app already, make sure that you re-engage with them, make sure they come back yeah. to the app, reuse it, re-engage with it, spend their money again. We really see that the more users are seeing remarketing campaigns, they're spending more. So it's, it's another force of, that they can use in order to grow this year. Great. What about you, Yael? Your top advice for Hyper Casual in 2021? Yeah, so we discussed a lot about the market and the opportunities to expand beyond the tier one. And I also mentioned about the importance of creatives. We know that in TikTok, creative is everything. We keep saying our slogan is uh, don't make ads, make TikTok. So definitely um, um, think about it when you're doing your next creative production. We know it's all around the creatives, also for hyper casual, especially. So not only create and show your gameplay, but also try to think it and to do it in a creative way, um, which will help you to communicate with your audience because the audience changed. And now they're, they're looking to interact in different ways and they are thinking in a different way and they want to, to, sh to see more native content. So be there and adjust your uh, strategy. Yeah, great. Anna, do you share the same advice? Do you have something more specific to add? Yeah, like, uh, like everything we discussed before, I would say um, geo expansion, um, exploring um, deeper funnel events for optimization, whether for bidding or just for optimization and uh, choosing the correct bids for CPI bidding, and crea creative diversification, of course. Great. Um, one last topic that is my favorite one, <laughs> a controversial one. Uh, we've seen a lot of concentration in the industry uh, in the past month, in the past week. It's happening every day. A new company is being bought, is being acquired. So we had AppLoving, they started as an ad network. They bought Max, monetization partner, bought a couple of game studios, started their own hyper casual uh, company. And three or weeks ago or months ago, surprised everyone uh, by the with the acquisition of Adjust, um, which really I think was a very bold move and very surprising move for the whole industry. I want source also ad network, monetization, Supersonic Studio, Luna, Sumla. Zynga announced after they bought Rolic a couple of months ago that they have intentions to buy more ad tech companies, ad network, monetization, attribution even. Um, what kind of signal is it sending to the market? The fact that you know now you have companies that are hosting the whole ecosystem within the same company. Like, what do you guys think about it? And I want to start with you, Inval, because I know that your motto from day one is unbiased. Uh, so, so what what do you have to say on that? I think that first of all, it was very surprising. So exactly as you said, especially for me, when you look at it from the adjust point of view of the deal, this really has an impact of how they'll be able to operate moving forward as an attribution provider. And as you said, being an attribution provider, the core principle of it is being unbiased, being objective, not being a part of this playground, right? You need to be the outside judge in order to even do attribution. You can't measure 
uh, your, your own companies. You can't compete with networks that you measure. Um, you don't buy traffic, you don't sell traffic. You really are objective so that both advertisers and partners can fully rely on your data and consider you the attribution authority. And that's no longer the case with Adjust. So I really think that the effect here is kind of pulling out one attribution provider. That's how I feel like advertisers that are using Adjust, no matter from which vertical, will need to start considering other attribution providers that are still objective, that can still be their measurement partners. And I believe there's a good opportunity for you guys because uh, just was popular amongst the hyper casual. Right. So and the effect on them is obviously even greater because hyper casual games that are using Adjust, Uplovin is a network, it's also a mediation platform, and it's also a publishing house of other hyper casual games. So it means that one of the biggest competitors, global competitors of any hyper casual advertiser that was using Adjust up until today now has access or is the owner of their attribution data. This means that all of their business strategy is, is jeopardized, right? They can see the networks that they're working with that are providing good value, creatives that are working well for them. Everything that they're doing is now exposed. So I think they will be the one quickly switching to other attribution providers that have the scale to support them and help them grow and not really risk their business. So for the last question, I would like to take us back to the main uh, topic of this panel, which is women in hyper casual. And I'd be curious to know if you think there are differences between men and women UA managers and the way they are handling their UA campaigns. So Anna, can you? Yeah, well, for me, like the short answer is, is no. <laughs> Um, I think I, I, you know, I was fortunate uh, to work with many talented people of, of all genders, um, but I would love uh, to see more women um, in user acquisition in general and uh, specifically in gaming, because like as we discussed uh, before, uh, we have this new uh, big, big audience of women gamers that are starting getting into it now. And, and I think that, that we need more women, both as developers and as marketers, to, to bring their own you know, unique point of view to the table when we have this new reality. What about you, Yael? Um, so I would, uh, I would agree with, with Anna with what she is saying, because yes, I'm working with both male and female, and both of them are doing an amazing job. But uh, if, if I will uh, take a look a bit about the women, I would say that they are much more opportunistic. They're looking for ways to make their work more useful and valuable in a short time. Um, they really want to prove themselves and to, uh, and to reach to, uh, to accomplishment in a shorter time and to be more hands-on uh, compared to male. Um, so definitely this is something that um, we are paying attention to because if we look on hyper casual industry, yes, we need to move fast, we need to be creative, we need to be innovative and definitely women are, are stronger in that um, and yes, I would, I'm hoping that we will see more and more females um, running campaigns and leading the hyper casual vertical uh, because they are doing an amazing job. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Yael. Staying efficient and reacting quickly is definitely uh, what we offer at BitShake to UA teams and what we're trying to help them achieve. So thank you so much, ladies, for being here today. Thank you for the valuable insights. I'm sure many marketers learned a lot. If you have any questions about the topics that we've covered, feel free to email us and we'll make sure that all your questions are answered. Uh, and of course, stay tuned for the next episodes of Women in Hypercasual by BitShake.